go. Excellent. All right. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, thank you guys for joining. Today we're going to be talking about Cash Fusion. Uh, there was no subtitle, so I just made it up myself. Uh, so flexible, arbitrary input, consolidation, coin joints. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see here. Ah, so this is the paper we're uh, we're looking at. It's uh, it's available on GitHub. Uh, the link is right here. Um, and I will also post a PDF version in the Wasabi Research um, uh, site uh, as well. Okay. Uh, what's going on? There we go. Uh, just a reminder of where we are. Um, we've done all of these things so far. The last three weeks, uh, actually the last four weeks, we've been concerned with Coin Shuffle and Coin Shuffle Plus Plus, which is a good predecessor to Cash Fusion. And then next week, it looks like we're going to be doing Cash Fusion again. Um, everything is available on the GitHub. Um, so let's just remind ourselves uh, what have we been talking about? Well, with Coin Shuffle and Coin Shuffle Plus Plus, the issue being addressed is the one of removing the coordinator. Um, so allowing individuals to collaborate amongst themselves in a trustless way, uh, given some uh, bulletin board um, that doesn't have any sort of uh, um, computation properties to it. It's just a bulletin board where people can gather together and, and, and meet up. Um, with coin shuffle, there was this onion encrypting of addresses and then having them shuffled around sequentially across peers. And we talked about why something like uh, Coin Shuffle might not scale, scale very well to many, many participants, but it works well with a, with a small number of participants. And a good example is Electron Cash, which has uh, five participants. Um, we then talked about Coin Shuffle Plus Plus, which uh, adds to the protocol by uh, introducing uh, a DC net that can handle collisions and disruptions in just four plus two F rounds, given F malicious peers. And sorry, I made a mistake there. It should be malicious peers. Um, so yeah, so we've been talking about these different ways of removing the coordinator and making these coin joins. Um, yeah, so this week, um, so let's start with the problem. So when users coin join with uh, Cash Shuffle or pretty much any protocol, they get usually many coins of equal denominations back to them, uh, many clean coins. So with Wasabi, they would get coins of 0.1 denominations. If they're using a different protocol, it might be a different uh, denomination, but overall they... they uh, they, they get many uh, clean coins. And so we need a way to private, uh, a private way for users to consolidate arbitrary number of coins without revealing input ownership. That's pretty much what we're looking for. And the protocol should not rely on a central coordinator uh, apart from some, something like a bulletin board. And uh, the protocol should allow <coughs> for arbitrary outputs of arbitrary amounts. Um, so a, a person should be able to have many inputs and, and many outputs. Um, Okay, so uh, I just wanted to be very clear about the problem, uh, and then uh, I'll have uh, um, uh, uh, one of the authors who's with us today. Um, uh, it, it, it's uh, John Ald, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, okay. I would, would hate to say your name wrong. Uh, he, he will answer our questions and, and maybe say more about the protocol, but I'll just be very clear here about the, about the, uh, the problem. So what you're looking at right now is, tip, is a typical you know, coin join type structure where three participants are getting together and they have these uh, equal output denominations. Um, and in this case, they have uh, one Bitcoin outputs and two Bitcoin outputs, for example. And then they have some change remaining. Um, and it, it, if they have change remaining, uh, it means that they likely want to have that change further mixed in a different coin join round. So you can imagine this is the second coin join now is built on top of the first one where all of the user's change is now being used to further mix um, those uh, anonymous, uh, 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 or the, the unclean changed uh, anonymously. And, and this continues, where people continuously uh, take the, the, the change of, of, of one coin join and use that in a future coin join to mix again. Um, and if you wanted to spend that Bitcoin, for example, let's say you wanted to spend three Bitcoin and you're the purple individual, well, then you would have to pick your UTXOs from these multiple coin joins and use them to consolidate into a single transaction to spend the, the three Bitcoins. Um, so the problem that we have is that if you're this Mr. Orange guy over here, 
Um, and you know, and I like to visualize coin joins as uh, almost like a blockchain. So just it's sequential, uh, and you know, coin joins happen in order, obviously, because the blockchain is in order. Um, so you can imagine that when someone like this orange guy uh, does a coin join, he participates at a certain point in in this coin join train or this this blockchain, this chain of coin joins. Um, and, and everyone in the world can see that this person participated in a coin join. Um, you know, if I gave Orange some money, then I can watch as, as Orange participates in a particular coin join. And then further, we can track as Orange participates in other coin joins with the change by following uh, where the change goes. Now, uh, Orange is not going to be able to participate in all of the coin joins, um, whether it, it's because Orange's laptop falls asleep or because he falls asleep or because um, he, he disconnects in one of the rounds. He's going to have a, a, a not necessarily a hundred percent success rate with coin joins. They might be a bit scattered, um, and so uh, after uh, the there is no change remaining or the change remaining is too small to coin join further. Um, if if Orange does not do any remixing, we can create a list of coin joins that Orange participated in. In this case, it's zero, one, three, and then minus two. Uh, and we can do that for a lot of the participants. We could take yellow, for example, and see where uh, uh, yellow participates, and uh, then uh, map out that list of coin joins, and then we could do that for other participants. And then what happens is, is if we observe someone who merges many, many coins together, we can ask where, which coin joins do those coins refer to? And in this case, we, we might see someone who's merging coins that uh, come from coin join 2, 3, and n minus 1. And the output doesn't really matter, so I just left it as a big O. Um, and so the result is that if we just look at purple, red, and yellow, uh, we can see clearly that only yellow uh, has participated in, the, in those coin joins. Um, so it's, 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 it's more likely that yellow is the, is the individual that sent the money and not uh, red or, or, or purple. So we, 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 we could reduce the number of people uh, that, that it could be. Uh, and, th and that's a problem with consolidation um, generally, in particular when users don't remix their coins. Um, so yeah, and, and notice that it, it could be the case that there are 100 participants in a coin join and that the coin join is completely secure, but you still need a trustless, secure, private method for consolidating your coins when, when, when you exit. Um, so yeah, so I'll, 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 I'll come clean and say that uh, I, I read the entire paper and uh, I think I understood most of it, but I, I didn't uh, come up with any sort of slides to explain um, much of it. I'm, I'm hoping that if others have read it, they'll have some good questions, but uh, that's pretty much where I'm going to leave it off here. Um, I'll, I'll say in, in summary, the idea of Cash Fusion is to allow for users to participate um, uh, without a coordinator to have um, uh, an arbitrary number of inputs and outputs such that uh, many users that do want to consolidate uh, or even uh, do something like a, like a, a, a spend or, 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 yeah, or just consolidate uh, can do that and hide amongst each other. Um, so it's sort of a complementary feature to uh, a coin join protocol. Uh, it's something that uh, would, would, would add to something like Cash Shuffle. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it at that, and I'll let uh, Jonald uh, jump in and, and say anything he wants to, and um, uh, get questions going. Thank you, Aviv. I see you were really busy working on the DC net still. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, so. I, I got super lost in the DC nets, so uh, I, I really apologize, guys, that I didn't have better slides, but... Uh. Janad, I would like to ask you something. Uh, it's it's still in the program space. Is that in uh, in an interview with I think with Coinspice with you that uh, you said that originally you created a cash fusion in, because you wanted the way to consolidate a cash shuffle outputs, but it kind of ended up being its its own larger thing uh is, is that correct yeah so when we, when we first uh developed cash shuffle um the problem that we noticed in practice right away was you know you end up with a lot of, of coins in your wallet and when you spend them together um it, it, it kind of ruins the privacy so i'm um, i think it's kind of the maybe it's the same exact thing that aviv was explaining um with with the the math or the 
the set diagrams, whatever it is, <laughs> those symbols what he was talking about. But it, basically, the problem in cash shuffle um, was that when you, you you know you end up with with two coins, one's an anonymized coin, the other is like a change output that's trivially linkable back to the input amount. So because of that linkage, um, it, it just causes a problem when you combine the coins because there's too much information <clears throat> that's kind of leaked out. So the idea was to let users um, consolidate their coins, but it's but, uh, Cash Fusion kind of turned into more than that as far as it's just this uh, general purpose coin join scheme where you can have like any number of inputs or outputs of uh, like any amounts. Uh, maybe maybe a follow up question to this directly uh, is that. The common input of the, or sorry, common ownership of the input uh, in a coin join specifically can be done with a subset sum analysis of the change. Right. So if, if Alice has two inputs and she gets the equal value output and a change, then of course the change plus the equal value leads to the sum of all of her inputs. Um, and and does uh, Cash Fusion defend against this too? Uh, that if you have a change, it cannot be linked back to the inputs. Um, yeah, I mean, so the so the way that we did it is uh, we kind of used this uh, like arbitrary amounts type of approach, so that uh, there really is no clear way to figure out, um, you know, the, the how the inputs line up to the outputs. Um, it's just it's just based on this uh, combinatoric math as far as like there's you know, a huge, astronomically huge number um, of different partitions. So it's really hard to, to figure out um, how things line up. Or, and, and there can be multiple ways that it can line up. So mm -hmm. you can't really isolate and say, oh, this, this change input goes with this, or this change output goes with this input. Um, that sort of goes, <laughs> that sort of all goes away when you have this, you know, when you're looking at a, a transaction with say uh, 80 inputs and, and 38 outputs. Mm -hmm, thank you. I just would like to know that uh, this is actually going to be the topic of the next uh, next research club conversation. So it's better not going into the combinatorics sure. because <laughs> it's yeah. going, to, going to be a whole session there. Yeah. Um, so that's like it, it's kind of interesting because when we were first looking at this, um, most of the people that were involved in testing cash flow and stuff with the other developers were focused on, um, on, on that side of things like the chain analysis side. And I, I started thinking about the other side of it. Um, like how do you coordinate it? Um, so when you have like in cash off, we have this, uh, um, I guess you guys called it like an onion, I guess, you know, I just call it like encrypted layers or whatever. Um, but so the problem would be if you have like multiple inputs, and by the time you peel all the onion layers away, you're left with um, individual buckets, but all of the each bucket has inputs that obviously go together. Or um, you could have like each input be wrapped in its own onion layer, but then you can't really tell like who the who's the culprit if if someone doesn't sign one of the inputs. So I, I started thinking of okay, how can we? have this system where like, you know, have some kind of system where we'll be able to blame a participant that doesn't sign all their inputs while at the same time I'm hiding the information of, of what, what inputs are linked together. And so, and so what I came up with was this idea of kind of everyone's just checking everyone else. <laughs> so if you imagine like 10 people, 10 players, if they're all in a room together, standing in a circle, it's like, hey, here, I'll give you one of mine. You give me one of yours. She gives me one of his, and, and so on. And uh, and then so initially, it was, I, I think I conceived it as kind of like a grid where it was like player one would check player two's input or first input, and then player two would check player three's. That ended up getting abandoned in, in favor of just like a, a purely random approach. So everyone... It's just like a random process of like every every input and output gets assigned to someone to check in case there's like you know if the transaction doesn't work then then you gotta check check them all and see see who's to blame. 
Um, something that I found very interesting in phase one, which is the setup and waiting list, is that you have different output tiers. Um, and maybe to, to summarize that, and please correct me if it's wrong, is that a user can register for different output tiers at the same time, and each output tier is the value of Satoshis in the output of this coin join. Um, and as soon as one of these output tiers gets filled up by a sufficient number of users, this is the tier value being chosen for the following round. Uh, and um, all the users who have registered for several tiers are removed from these tiers that are not, that are not being done. Yeah, so um, it's a good question. So in, in Cash Shuffle, um, things are a little bit more simpler. So you, we, we had like a, a round on each order of magnitude. So if you have a coin, you know, like a point oh, point one coin or a, um, a point oh one coin or a point oh one coin, each of those forms a tier. Uh, and then in Fusion, I guess this is kind of Mark's work. Um, he, he, he kind of arranged it more from like an exponential distribution point of view uh, where the, the amounts, because the amounts are non-standard, they're all kind of within like a, an exponentially random uh, range. So you can have like a, uh, like a 0.1 tier, but it also accepts like, you know, a coin that would be 0.3 or one that's 0.07 or whatever. And then um, w with all of these protocols, uh, how it works in the wallet is we freeze the coin when it's starting to go into a round. So when you're just waiting for a round to start, I think the coin will get frozen, but then, um, yeah, and then the round will start and then you'll just, the, you'll kind of remove yourself from the other tiers because that coin is, is being used already. Okay, thanks. And, and then the follow-up question would be, um, the, in the paper, it only says examples of, for example, 10,000 Satoshis or 20,000 Satoshis. Uh, but I'm, I'm a bit confused if, if this indicates a range. So like 10,000 Satoshis plus minus 2,000 or something, um, because it does not indicate the equal amount, right? Because there is no equal amount in cash fusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess that's... Uh... I, I guess that's the amount of the output, like roughly, roughly speaking, like, you know, is it, is it 10,000 Satoshis or is it a hundred million Satoshis? So, um, you, you kind of want, you, you don't want like one guy with a huge coin to try to mix in with other people that are using tiny coins because then his outputs will stick out. So you want everyone to sort of be at least in the ballpark, right? Yeah, all right. Thank you. Um, so th th this is phase one. The clients connect to the server and download the list of parameters and 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 and, and figure out which which tire they want to go. Uh, let's go to phase two then, which is starting the round. Uh, what's what's happening here? It's uh, in phase two. The clients send a. No, the server send a message to the clients, which is uh, which contains round public key, twenty three unique nouns, and the location of where the covert submission should be later made. I have uh, I have some questions for this. So, this twenty three nouns here, what should this be? Yeah. So this this is all um, all, all this non stuff uh, non stuff. <laughs> is uh, part of, of using blind signatures. So um, one particular challenge of, uh, maybe I should just explain the background of why, why we're even using those blind signatures. Um, so because we need to get there. But what what that, that, what? Yeah. I, I, the, the thing with like having multiple outputs, um, it's not like an input where if if you don't actually include an input, um, it'll just fail because. Or sorry, um, let me just think about this. Yeah, okay, so okay, if you include extra inputs, it doesn't really matter. But if you include extra outputs, as we all know, the inputs can't be greater than um, can't be less than the outputs. So how do you prevent someone from including an extra output and still blame them? So what we did is kind of create these, we call them like uh, like a submission token, 
where you have to have a token to, to submit your, your transaction component. So um, the, the server provides these nods points, and then the client prepares a, a blind signature request using that nods point, and then it, uh, the server will, uh, will complete that request and, and, and sign it, and then the client will unblind it and, and per, then per, uh, have that signature to present with the, with the transaction component. So it's a little bit complicated to think about, but um, basically it's just like um, it, it's it's like you're you're signing or the server is signing that you're allowed to submit something, and then when you submit it, it it knows that it's it's valid, so it prevents the user from submitting like too many inputs or outputs. You have to submit exactly twenty three components, either inputs and outputs or a blank. Does that make sense? I know it's a little bit abstract, but <laughs> it, it, it makes sense for me at least. Uh, and and the second thing here is that uh, there is a the, there is a location where covertly later the components has to be submitted. But why why do you need the different location? Aren't you assuming that that uh, you are using new Tor streams and this is where uh, you know what I mean? Like, is, is it is up to this point? Are you on the clear net or, or what's going on here? Um, so, okay, yeah, the, the, the there's covert announcements of the transaction components and also covert announcement of the signatures, but there's also like a, a clear net connection um, as far as uh, like if, if, the, if the client just like loses the internet or something, then we know to just, we can just disconnect that player. Uh, there's, there's a couple other things like that. Not everything is done over Tor. Like it doesn't need to be. It's just, there's some advantages to just having, just having the regular connection. Um, like, a, and, and uh, like, it, for example, in the blame phase, like if you don't send your blame in time or something, we just know to kick that player. So um, it, it's, it's good. Like from, to prevent like timeout attacks and stuff like that, like like denial of service by timing out. So not everything depends on the Tor connection. We just make sure that the, the, the purpose of the Tor connection is so that the server can't group um, transaction components by their IP address. Mm -hmm. And uh, wouldn't that lead to cross-referencing? Uh, so for example, in this round, these inputs participated and in the next round, uh, totally different inputs participated, but uh, you could cross-reference that, hey, there must be a link between this round and this round because there was the same IP, or 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 or, or is is this something like like every client that's online at the time is 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 doing these things that are not over Tor, or or it just you know what I mean. Yeah. So okay, I think I get. I, I kind of understand what you're getting at. So you're saying that if if this if there's um, like ten players and one of them drops out, um, then we could see like which which transaction uh, components that they were, and can, the server could kind of link them together. Yeah, I think I think there's uh, the, there there are things like that. Um, I mean, there's a couple ways that that uh, those kind of things can be mitigated. So one is each, if you, you should really have a lot of UTXO in your wallet and each time there's a new fusion, uh, like a, a different random subset can be selected. Um, the other the other thing is just doing multiple fusions. So, um, you know, the user should never dep depend on like, a, you know, a single fusion for their privacy. Uh, it's, always, it's always possible that... Um, people could end up just like consolidating all of their coins. Like if five or six players all happen to spend all their outputs, it would reduce the privacy for that round. So um, in Bitcoin cash, because you know, the fees are low enough, we can, we can afford to do that and just, just uh, rely on multiple rounds to prevent those kind of things. But it's not, you know, it's not perfect. Uh, I, I, sorry, I, that's not really what I meant, and I cannot claim I fully understand the attack you mentioned there. But what I meant is that if I participate in this round and I participate in the next one and I participate in a round tomorrow, then the server would know that I 
participated in these rounds? Hmm. Okay. But I wouldn't really know which um, which component, which inputs or outputs were yours in that round. Yeah, yeah, that's that's correct. But yeah, I guess I guess th- there's a lot of things that a, that a malicious server can do. I think we we talked about it in the spec. Um, I mean, theoretically, the worst thing that it, it could do is just kind of have a custom back end where every person is kind of like getting uh, extreme sibled, like just kind of isolated and put in with with fake um, play other players under control by the server. So um, I think th- those kind of problems only get solved at scale when there's just a, a lot of people participating. Um, and there could be other things like proof of participation or whatever. Uh, but yeah, there's there's definitely some shenanigans that <laughs> that a malicious server can do. We just you know we just tried to solve them them as best we can as far as um, preventing the server from from trivially spying. And uh, yeah, these these kind of things that you're talking about are, are still possible to try to try to gain information over multiple rounds. And hopefully, no one no one malicious is running the server, but. Uh, you know, there can be at scale. There can be multiple servers. So, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, and now that you that you also bring up, um, you know, t- uh, time out attacks as denial of service. Uh, what I notice is that throughout the paper and starting in phase two, you mentioned these um, time out periods after which the round either is successful or or abandoned, um, uh, and they're they're all within seconds. Um, and you know, from from experience in, in Wasabi, we only have three phases, and each of them takes several minutes. Um, and still, many users do not respond in time because of, for example, like a broken tour or, or something, or, or just latency. Um, so, how did you come up with these timeouts? Uh, the, the specific value of them? Mm. Yeah, that's probably more of a question for Mark, who did the did the actual coding on this. Um, I'm not sure what you guys are doing that's taking minutes, but uh, I think one, one thing that we did to speed things up is to like establish all the tour circuits like ahead of time and kind of get them ready. And then, and then uh, things get a lot faster. Um, and probably also in Wasabi, there's a lot more players. I'm not sure. I've looked at some of the transactions. There's, they, look, they look pretty huge. But uh, usually, like at least so far in our testing, there's been like somewhere like six to nine players or something like that. So it's not it's not too bad as far as uh, latency. But I was surprised also a little bit as far as just how well it does work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, one more thing. So one one more thing in Wasabi is that we don't have a. We don't have a communication where the what the server initiates. It's 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 always like a HTTP request. You know, like you ask for something from the server and the server replies. And and this way, when the server would have to initiate something, then you always have to wait for the clients to actually ask for that thing. So that uh, that takes time. It's it's not because it's not possible. It's because or or it's not it doesn't make sense to have that. <laughs> but it's because it was very hard to implement and I failed in it. So so that 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 makes it longer. Uh, but yeah, we're all, we're also using uh, like libsec p two fifty six. Um, so that's like it makes signing way faster. Um, especially so when you have these transactions that have like lots of inputs. Um, and uh, it, yeah, it just it just runs way faster with the libsec library. I think I think the guys from Electrum first implemented that, and the, we we saw the difference like in speed. Um, Callan ported ported that back to Electron Cache, and you could like something that like a huge transaction with where you have to sign for like fifty inputs or something like that would take like thirty seconds, and then now it takes like one second or something. So that helps. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, let's go to phase three, uh, which is player commitments. It's a very interesting phase. Um, 
All right. So as far as I understand, it's about it, this in this phase, uh, the players are sending their commitments to their transaction components to the server, and they are sending these uh, in, in in one chunk. So it, it's not like they are sending these one by one in different uh, over different or circuits or anything like that. They are sending this. In, in one chunk, and what are these commitments? Uh, it, <laughs> this is a lot of components, but basically, it, it's these are hashes mm -hmm. to a bunch of things like what what you will need later to ensure the trustlessness. Uh, anything you would like to add to this phase? Well, I mean, it's it, it's not really that complicated. It's basically just you know the basic idea is. You know, you take your component, which is either an input or an output, and you, and you just hash it. So, um, so the hash forms uh, like a commitment, and um, that way you can check later if uh, the actual input matches the hash that you said it was. Now, the reason you need to salt it is because um, there's just not that many, so you could do like a you know a brute force lookup or I don't know whatever you call it, a rainbow table. You can just hash every input or you know every all the inputs and outputs and just get all the hatches and you could reverse look up uh be very easy so that's why you need to salt it and then there's this is kind of touching on some of the other phases but that someone could theoretically cheat by trying to use the same salt so um to prove the salt is unique you also have to salt the hash and pair that with when you when you uh submit the the input and basically, it's just a salted hash in this phase. Okay, okay, very much, thanks. Um, and the question is, the salt is unique for every component? Uh, yeah. Um, it's just a random 256-bit number. Yeah, every, every component gets a different salt. All right, thank you. So let's go to other, the Yes? Yeah. No, I was going to say, otherwise, uh, someone could, like, um, if when it comes to the blame phase, if someone knew the salt, then they could kind of reverse look up, like, all, your, all the other stuff. So they could try that salt number on everything and, and learn a lot about the, about the linkages between the inputs. So, yeah, that's why <laughs> every, everything gets its own uh, unique salt number. <laughs> uh, okay, so in phase four, uh, the server actually, this is kind of phase three too, right? It's, it's, it's a response to the previous message with the blind signature. Is that, is that correct? Or there is something in between? Um, in phase four? Uh, so yeah, like that's just basically... Um, uh, what? Wait, what, what do we blind here? Uh, you're blinding the nonce point, I believe. Ah, uh, okay. Yes, okay. So, so we are blinding the 23 nonce point and we are getting a blind signature for that. Yeah, uh, yeah that, that, that's something I, I wanted to to know that uh, that's actually a very good would be a very good if we would want to work with the current wasabi model that would be a very good uh, extension to that that uh, what what we also realize that we don't really have to blind the outputs because right because we blinded the 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 output addresses and you don't really need you can just blind like like anything and and you can use that anything to 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 do stuff later on the server. Anyway, this was just a quick quick comment. And finally, in phase five, we have the covert announcements of inputs and outputs. Now, in Cache Fusion, we have you, you you call it a component, and a component could be an input component, an output component, or a blank component. Um, but everyone has to submit twenty three of them. It doesn't matter at what ratio uh, you have to submit 23 of them and as I understand you are submitting everything covertly 
over wow. new circuits, right? So mm. there is no there is no no linkage between these components, right? Right, right. You you could get into like the whole discussion about Tor and whether certain exit nodes are going to be DOS or something. But yeah, assuming Tor is working <laughs> as it should, then uh, should be no linkages. Yeah, I, I I think that's that's more the reason able to consider Tor practical. <laughs> And and also it, it doesn't have to be over exit nodes uh, anyway. Yeah, I'm not so, an expert in Tor, but yeah, that's uh, yeah. Every every each of the twenty three uh, messages is is sent over a different circuit. Um, sorry, uh, you say you covered announcement of inputs and outputs in phase five, and then in phase six you're actually sharing the components. Uh, so where's the difference between announcing and sharing the components? Uh, sharing is just the server gets like has everyone's components and it just sends it back to everyone. So then everyone gets has a copy of everyone else's after phase six. Yeah, we just get into phase six then. So in phase six, the server, so so the server shuffles the components and it shares the components with everyone, like all the components with all the clients, but in a, uh, wait, are we sharing the components? Yes. Yes. So, 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 sorry. Yes. We're sharing the components, not the commitments. Okay. So we are giving out all the components to everyone. That, that's so far correct, right? Yeah. So in, in phase five, the, the players send their, um, components to the server in phase six the server sends all the components back to everyone and then in phase seven we sign them mm -hmm. yeah and then yes in that phase also uses tor and does we just call it covert announce so we covertly announce the, the signatures then the, then the server has all the signatures and it can put the whole transaction together which is basically phase eight Yes, thank you. So that was phase eight, executing the transaction. Yes, yeah, so from here on, things are kind of falling into place, uh, except, the, except the blaming phase, which... <laughs> yes, so everyone has everything, but... but I don't want to go into the blaming phase. I, I would rather just ask questions there because <laughs> at the <laughs> because at, at the beginning I thought that <laughs> so it's it's a really interesting approach and quite honestly that that, that gives me a, a headache that 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 people have to share with share things with each other with random peers. It gives me a headache from an implementation point of view that we don't have right now, and I've never done that. But, but anyway, uh, the the problem I thought there is first is that oh, then the random players actually learn stuff. But then, as I was reading forward, they don't really learn stuff because there is some interesting interaction between the server and the players that that not even the players learn is is that correct uh, interpretation do i understand yeah. that yeah yeah because um when the players are verifying it during the blame phases they're just verifying one component at a time and, and the no one knows no one even has a list except the server of of um of the like of the commitments so the server knows that hey here's alice's 10 hash commitments but the other players don't know that so they're just looking at one uh, uh component at a time they know that okay i've got to verify these eight components but they don't know which players maybe it corresponds to 
Maybe three of them are from one guy and two of them are from another. Maybe they're all from different people. No one really knows. And so um, by, by keeping that list only on the server, um, it, it, it prevents the players from learning anything. And then um, the, the server itself doesn't learn because it's not participating in doing those, um, doing those checks. The only time the server learns is when someone gets blamed, um, then it's sort of revealed, like, they, they, can, they know oh, this is Alice's transaction that got blamed, but all, just learning one of Alice's inputs doesn't really tell it anything, doesn't give it any information. Yeah, thank you. So you you are uh, leaving soon, and I want to give others the chance to to ask questions, to not just us. But before that, I I want to close this with the with 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 a quote, which is either from you or Mark. I did not check, but I I think it was very very instructive in in a way that 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 is very practical so on the design trade-offs part is when making design choices in this situation there is trade-off between patching tiny security holes versus adding complexity and unreliability in the form of more protocol phases one must first understand that even with a perfect fusion protocol, civil attacks are possible and can be taken to the extreme if the server is malicious. Many of the trade-offs center around the server. When judging the merits of a security trade-off, it is helpful to compare what the security hole allows versus the existing attacking vectors, which may be already large attack surfaces. So yeah, that's that's uh, I think that's that's a great uh, example of how you come out and and actually talk about the big picture. But what what many papers just lose track of <laughs> at this point of time in in, in the paper. So I, I think it's 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 really instructive. So thank you and Igor, Aviv, Olga. Rafael, uh, please uh, join in if you have some notes or questions. I had a question um, just about um, sort of implementation. If there's any uh, intuition that you have in terms of how long it would take for the protocol to uh, to go through and how it scales with more participants with more inputs and more outputs if there's anything you can say about that um, what, do you, what do you mean when you say go through uh, so so let's suppose there are 10 participants with with 10 coins each um, do you have an estimation of, of how long a protocol like this would take to um, from the time oh, that the peers okay. establish connection to the time the coin join is 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 broadcasted. Um. So I guess so far in practice, it seems like it's not taking very long. Maybe like less than thirty seconds, and that's with uh, maybe like seven or eight people. Um. It could take longer if there's more people, and especially if there's rounds where where players get kicked out. So we do the thing. This is kind of an idea from Coin Shuffle Plus Plus. It's just you kick one bad player out and just continue with one one fewer in the in the size of the round. So um, if you had like I don't know, like fifteen people, and then you had to redo it for fourteen and thirteen and so on, it could add add time to it. Um, but I think it's like it's still going to be like on the order of like a minute to to two or three minutes or something, maybe faster. And so, does this the scale linearly? Do you think, or uh... oh, that's a really good question. I think uh, I don't. I have to think about it. <laughs> Seems like it would scale. Um, hmm. Maybe it would scale better than linear because there's there's like it's kind of happening in parallel. Like everyone's kind of signing it on their own on the, like the client side. So if you add more clients, it's not necessarily going to take longer um yeah but i have to think about a little bit more so uh because things are paralyzed unlike 
cash shuffle, if, if I'm not mistaken, which is sequential, um, then there's no issue there. But with more participants, it's more likely that one of the participants will, by accident, go offline. Uh, right. So, um, and, and you're saying that it's it would probably be linear in terms of number of, of, of malicious peers or accidentally malicious peers. Yeah, you bring up an interesting point. Like with so at one point, um, uh, I was considering the idea of like, could we could we just use layered encryption instead of using Tor? But like you said, that that doesn't scale, or it, it's, it takes longer the more people you have. So um, that that's kind of like goes back to the part of the spec that uh, Napara was reading about as far as just the, the trade offs. Like you could you could have it maybe better than Tor, but if it's gonna if you have to wait until a hundred inputs and outputs get um, decrypted based on like an onion scheme, then that's gonna take a long time. So uh, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> oh yeah, um, I'm not gonna ask more because I want uh, the other guys to ask. So now's your chance. Okay. Um, no question, guys. Yeah, go ahead because I I have a lot <laughs> and and only five minutes left. <laughs> go ahead, no problem. Adam, Adam, you go, you go. Okay, so just quickly, I want to thank you that uh, you put this on GitHub because many of the research are you, you just can't contribute and 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 it's 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 really bad. Even the authors cannot change when they make a mistake later on. They they publish it and and they are not able to modify the the research. So that's and others cannot contribute or you cannot see the reviews. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, on the follow-up notice that I've actually done a couple of typo fixes and you guys were replying on, on GitHub but did not merge my typo fixes. So what oh, was <laughs> Yeah. Um, but yeah, thanks to you guys for, for like having me on the call and being uh, interested in, in the protocol. It's, it's good that people from different blockchains can you know, can be friends and, and collaborate. Yeah, you know, privacy is more important than any of the ego of us. And it's it's uh, it's it's quite a shame when when two two projects go against each other just because they have different philosophy. Uh, yeah. And, and and thank you very much. Uh, um, so as a, as a summary, I would say it's it's a very interesting protocol with a lot of ideas in it and very complex. I would not go one as as it is and try to implement it because I'm afraid I would I would figure out too late things. I I, I would try at first to come up with a easier scheme that solves the same problem, and if I end up not succeeding in that then that's when I would, would look into this but there are some very interesting ideas like uh, all what we didn't even talk about the operating stuff that's how to ensure that the the server doesn't lie that's, that's actually a very in important idea that, that even Tom Babit was, was fighting with the exact same problem and even we were fighting with the exact same problem in, in, in Wasabi and our our solution was like just to waste a lot of uh, bandwidth. <laughs> so, yeah. So th thank you, John. Yeah. I think um, the simpler thing, it's like you, you could theoretically just not do the blame stuff and just kind of either hope it works or if it doesn't work, you just retry the, you just retry with, you know, the whole new round and eventually it'll work. But we wanted to try to take on the challenge of, of putting that, um, you know, anti-DOS stuff kind of at least just having a foundation to be able to, to do some of that. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I agree with Adam here. I think there are a couple of very good ideas in here. Um, and uh, one thing, though, that I'm still curious about uh, is, is in the worst case, 
during the blame phase, who learns what about the other participants, right? So, so there's there's a random peer which will verify the component, but he cannot link all these components together. So even even the the peer verifier cannot uh, you know, cluster these components and thus coins. Um, and however, oh yeah, and the, the server does not take part in this uh, blame phase. So he does not get individual. No, the server does get individual components too. So there's there's a um, there's a communication key with every every component. So if Alice is um, supposed to submit like a proof of correctness to let's say Bob, um, she's going to use Bob's uh, communication key. Um, and and send and send her information to Bob. Now if Bob gets and, and so she encrypts it. Everyone, everyone, like all the players can see that there's an encrypted message from Alice, which is supposedly her her correct um, input. Sorry. Uh, so uh, if Bob then says that hey server, this is not right, uh, he shares that private communication key with the server and then the server can see what Alice actually sent and decrypt it to see if it was correct. Um, so uh, no one except the server knows that the key is actually Bob's per se or Alice's quote unquote. Uh, they just, the other players just see that there's some component being verified. And it's really the, 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 everyone's kind of trusting the server not to be disruptive. So if the server says that, hey, this proof didn't come through, we're going to kick you out, you know, everyone's trusting the server not to, like, you know, met, like, uh, intentionally cause issues with <laughs> with it working. Um, okay, okay, that's very interesting. Um, yeah. You know, and, and, and then further, e even if a user collaborates or, or colludes with the server and, and both are malicious, uh, be, because they they commit to um, you know the the randomness up front in the blame phase they cannot really choose who will be part uh, of, of blaming whom right whom do you send your components to amongst peers uh, so this means if there's for example one malicious user and the malicious server they still only know the linkage of a random um, components right? and not not all from one user. Um, so I think even in this case, if there's only one or like a, a couple malicious users collaborating with the server, I think it still holds up with privacy. Yeah, if there's like a couple malicious users, then I think what can happen is um, there can be there can be multiple people um, that end up getting their components checked, and when they send it back to the server, the server can kind of trying to match them up, like, oh, these three were from Alice. So it might learn like, a little bit of information. But then again, the server could also try to learn that just just by controlling players anyway. Just be, so nothing that nothing was really gained too much. Yes, okay. Well, well thank you very, very much for joining us here on the call. It was very helpful. Uh, it's always great to get the insights from the authors and, and just more context about the papers. Uh, so thank you very much for joining. Um, and, and thank you guys for having me again. Thank you so much, Donald. Uh, we appreciate it. Cool. Well, we'll, we'll talk again. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, just a reminder: next week we're doing the combinatorics bit. Uh, so, uh, John. Oh, well, uh, the, well. We'll let the authors know that if they would like to join us again, they can they can join us again for that. Okay. All right. Uh, so, Rafael, you, you, you had some things to say. Could you go ahead? No, I didn't actually. I was just uh, telling you to go ahead and ask your questions. Oh, all right. Uh, okay, so let, let, let me see. Um, <laughs> you know, since he left, my question seems really boring at this point of time. But uh, Ovi wanted to to talk about a bit uh, about a coin shuffle plus plus. 
Mm. Aviv. Oh, Aviv is away for three months. Okay. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> so let me see what else do I have here. Oh, why? Uh, yes. So tomorrow is go- tomorrow. Next week is going to be just a bit of scheduling is the f- is the last uh, agreed upon topic. And from there on, uh, do you guys have any, uh, any, <laughs> I mean, we agreed upon the direction, right? That we are going into the anonymization and and unequal inputs and try to and heuristics and and who else? Maybe just look into blockchain analysis uh, papers and and try to get the blockchain analyzers get on the show. That would be really fun and quite unique. What do you think about that? <laughs> Yeah, you know, actually, I, th- I think talking about heuristics would be very interesting, and a good summary for that might be the Bitcoin Privacy Wiki, uh, which which has or the Bitcoin Wiki with the chapter on privacy, which has uh, all heuristics very well curated and explained. So that might be a, a good one week discussion to talk about all the heuristics mentioned in there. Yeah, so, indeed. Yeah. That's uh, good. Uh, anyway, the, the next week, just, just to be clear, is going to be co- cash fusion or not really cash fusion, but crash fusion brought up this conversation. So it's going to be one uh, one paragraph, one chapter, one paragraph of paragraph of cash fusion, the combinatorics part, and there is a lot of online discussion if that can work that way or cannot work that way. I will gather all the resources I've seen, uh, Bitcoin dev mailing list and and some medium articles. So that will be very interesting to to see if we can if we can get to the bottom of it. If really how how well would naive coin joints work at what conditions? So that will be next week. So Aviv, are you back already? <laughs> I'm here. So you wanted to talk about Coin Shuffle Plus Plus uh, briefly, but what team did not appear? So I guess you didn't enforce it. Uh, do you do you have something to discuss there? Yeah. So um, what I would really like to know, uh, and and what I I couldn't personally figure out was. Um, how a DC network could uh, could completely avoid collisions um, and have all participants uh, be able to submit a, a message. So what I really wanted to show is that three participants using this, you know, you know Tim's uh, uh, DC network could actually do this. And I tried it very, uh, uh, I, I tried it for a very long time. I actually replicated the uh, the uh, um, uh, finite field using using AES um, because it, it's it's an eight bit finite field and uh, and I was trying to show that this could work um, uh, for a small eight bit message just a single byte and I, and I and I couldn't do it. Um, the problem that I get is that uh, when he does this. Uh, s- s- uh, power sums, and then he uses uh, Newton's identities to uh, uh, create this polynomial. Um, I only ever get encrypted messages um, as the uh, uh, um, as the inter- intercepts uh, um, uh, of the x-axis. Uh, so, as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, I'm struggling to replicate this. I reached out to Tim. He gave he gave a, a good explanation as well as code in C++. And Yuval said he's happy to help me uh, replicate uh, uh, with with the uh, with the code. Um, but I would have to understand the code well enough to understand how it works because from from where I'm sitting, what Tim Ruffing the claims he made sound like magic to me um, because he essentially says that three people. Um, who are 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 submitting encrypted messages three times, 
uh, you can do this magic on it, and then it creates a polynomial where the x-intercepts are the unencrypted messages. And to me, this it, 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 I just can't believe it until I see it, and I still haven't seen it yet. So that, that, that that's where I am. If, if anyone is familiar with... Um, with with this problem and can help, then please do. But that that's where I am. Yes, uh, I would. I let Max explain this to you. Respect the authority of the chief wizard of Bitcoin. Uh, Tim is right, of course. <laughs> no, I think you are way too too ahead of us. To be honest, it's like, like I I. I I, I get really happy when I get a holistic understanding of coin shuffle, but you, you're you're just going into the math. It's like that's that's amazing. Yeah. Well, I, be, because the the thing is, is that a collision free DC network is very important for us as as a tool. Even put everything else in coin shuffle plus plus aside, that's a pretty cool tool, and we don't know when we'll need it. Um, so at a minimum, we should understand that tool uh, well enough that um, that uh, you know I should be able to tell and talk to Lucas or you and explain in a way that we all understand how, how to do this. And, and and currently, it's still magic to me. Like I'm I'm actually not even convinced it, it'll work. Um, but maybe it's just too too complex. It's above my pay grade, so to speak, in terms of the math. Um, but I'm I'm trying hard to understand. Well, you see, just just in general, there will be times when we will have to go very deep into the bottom of the things. Like we are already going uh, much deeper than any other like podcasts or discussions. But uh, for example, on the Nutsack paper, I would really prefer if we spend one more week on it because I was uh, I was writing code for it and and then oh my god the third algorithm and the second algorithm was buggy and you know it's like uh, I'm I'm still not convinced that the Napsack paper actually works or what's the real intuition there but uh, but the show must go on the there is a new topic every Peak and and in the end, it's more effective if we if if we go on until all of us decide to okay, let's now double down on this great idea because th this is this is something. And I don't feel like uh, that that kind of idea the DC networks because it's solving problems that I don't want to solve. Which is the 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 ultimate decentralization, or or at least I don't want to solve at this point of time. Maybe ten years from now, when I become older and my beard will be longer, you know. <laughs> yep. Actually, though, what we might do for next week when we do the combinatorics of ca cash fusion, um, because it's only one paragraph in cash fusion, this might be worth to c compare to uh, Knapsack. And see maybe where the differences are, right? And and just take this opportunity to double down on on Knapsack and look at it again with with fresh eyes. So there are uh, there are things on in Knapsack that maybe I could because the the next week topics is going to be naive coin joins. Uh, we sparked the discussion on cash fusion, and so cash fusion is just one paragraph. But there is a very long uh, discussion on Bitcoin dev mailing list. Okay, not that long, but people wrote small novels there, like in every email. <laughs> so that might be might be hard to understand. And also, someone wrote a blog post and actually uh, some some software to try to verify or disprove their claim. And you know, so th there are content there that 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 we can go through, and and Napsack is definitely that. I will, uh, okay, I promise you, I will try to 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 find the interesting, the, the relevant paragraphs in in Napsack because yes, definitely Napsack was the one who 
who approach this problem in a more formal way and, and that's that's important. So okay. Yeah, I I will I will get all the resources together and people will know what to what to look at. Uh, if you wanted to reply to topics uh, two topics before, right? Yeah, uh that's fine. I I think it's okay to stop recording, right? Uh... Yes, so let, let's